This is the Human Action Podcast, where we debunk the economic, political, and even cultural myths of the days. Here's your host, Dr. Bob Murphy. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Human Action Podcast. This week, I'm going solo again. We're doing another uh, deep dive back into the, the classic topics. What I'm going to be speaking on is uh, explaining what the classical economists meant with their either labor or cost theory of value, and then what the problems with that were and why we had the so-called marginal revolution and got our modern subjectivist marginal approach to utility theory. But before we dive into that, let me mention that right now the Mises Institute for the next two weeks is giving away free copies of Dr. Parabylin's primer on economics, which is called How to Think About the Economy. So this book was written to accomplish something big, economic literacy. It's intentionally kept very short to be inviting rather than intimidating, as economics books typically are. And it's a perfect introduction for friends and family to solid free market economics from an Austrian point of view. So again, you can get your free copy of Parabylin's How to Think About the Economy if you go to mises.org slash H-A pod free. So that's for human action podcast free, but it's mises.org slash H-A-P-O-D-F-R-E-E, H-A pod free to get your free copy of Pear's book, but it's only for the next two weeks that the special offer exists. So act now. Okay, so the motivation for the topic today is uh, I recently, so two episodes ago, I believe, talked about Say's Law. And in motivating that in the beginning, I had this almost offhand remark saying, you know, just, just realize everybody, even though I'm encouraging you to go read these classic writers like, you know, J.B. Say and Frederick Bastiat and so on, David Hume, be careful just because there's a lot of ancient wisdom there and there's many respects in which modern economists have forgotten what people back in the 1700s, 1800s knew in terms of economics – Nonetheless, they did have shortcomings. And again, almost as, a, as an aside, I said that even the great French classical economists like J.B. Say and Frederick Bastiat had some version of a labor theory of value. And then I even tried to reproduce off the top of my head this, this passage I had remembered reading. I knew it was from one of the two of them, and I couldn't remember if it was Say or Bastiat. And in the comments after that episode dropped, besides all of the lavish praise I received, at least one or two people said, Bob, you're not, no, that's not right. J.B. Say did not have a cost or a labor theory of value. He had a you know, utility approach. And I went, and, and there are some passages from Say's work that, yes, say, you know, the, the value of goods derives from their usefulness or utility to humans. So I probably should have been more nuanced in what, in what I said, but if you go back and re-listen to that section, I, I was clear that I was saying it's not that the classical economists are dumb and they don't understand the role of scarcity. Like we often say, oh, Adam Smith didn't know why diamonds had a higher market value than water. And he, he kind of did. It's just saying that the standard framework that the classical economists used to explain exchange ratios in the marketplace depended on what we would call nowadays, you know, cost considerations as opposed to starting from scratch with what we now would call marginal utility. Okay, so that's what my, my point was. And just to buttress that, let me first read to you, uh, this is from David Ricardo's Principles of Political Economy and Taxation, or On the Principles of Political Economy and Taxation. They weren't afraid of longer titles back then. So I think this was first published in 1817. Okay, so to be clear, besides Adam Smith, if you say who is a, you know, the quintessential classical economist is David Ricardo. And so what I'm going to just show you is how much even David Ricardo, as of 1817, well, the version I'm reading here is probably the final re re third edition revised in 1821. So I don't know how much <laughs> the thing may have changed in those four years. So at least as early as 1821, David Ricardo is going to have some remarks here that I'm going to read to you that may surprise you if you've got it in your head that, oh yeah, b before the marginal revolution of 1871, all the economists just thought that market prices were due to cost or to the amount of labor hours that were congealed in the product. 
And then in 1871, all of a sudden, everybody's like, wait, it's utility. Oh my gosh, whoever thought of that? And scarcity. So no, in general, whenever you're looking at stuff, particularly in the social sciences, um, or you know, things like philosophy, there's almost never a writer you can point to and say, this was the first person in human history who ever said anything like this. There's always antecedents and, you know, proto whatever the new school is. Okay, so here, um, again, I'm just trying to caution you, even though historians of economic thought, and I probably am guilty of this too when I used to teach this, you know, back in college to undergrads, like to have nice timelines and say, oh, and then in this year, there was this innovation, and then the theory, it's usually in practice, especially before it was mathematically modeled, and so it was more people just using words, talking about stuff. It's hard to come up with a crisp, like, yep, this was the first time in history that somebody had this particular notion. Like, that. that's not often the case. So anyway, here we go. This is from, you know, I don't have to go deep into Ricardo's treatise here. This is chapter one, the title of which is On Value. So I'm just going to read to you, I don't know, six or seven paragraphs if you want to pace yourself mentally. And I think you may be surprised if you had had this stark dichotomy in your head between what the classical economists thought and then what we moderns with our subjectivist approach to value theory think. Okay. Um, so the the way this chapter starts, it has sort of like a little blurb summarizing what we're going to cover in this chapter. And so Ricardo says, the value of a commodity or the quantity of any other commodity for which it will exchange depends on the relative quantity of labor which is necessary for its production and not on the greater or less compensation which is paid for that labor. All right, so that's the central proposition that he's going to try to get across in this chapter. So right there, you might say, aha, see, David Ricardo, classical economist, labor theory of value, boom, QED. I don't see any word, you know, any mention of utility in there or an appreciation for how scarcity matters. And hang on, though. Okay, so now that was like the the blurb about like, hey, here's what we're going to cover in this chapter. And now we're starting with the main text. So this is Ricardo speaking. It has been observed by Adam Smith that, quote, the word value has two different meanings and sometimes expresses the utility of some particular object and sometimes the power of purchasing other goods which the possession of that object conveys. The one may be called value in use, the other value in exchange. The things, he continues, which have the greatest value in use have frequently literal or no value in exchange, and on the contrary, those which have the greatest value in exchange have little or no value in use, end quote. Okay, so that's Ricardo quoting from Smith, and now Ricardo is elaborating on that. Water and air are abundantly useful. They are indeed indispensable to existence. Yet, under ordinary circumstances, nothing can be obtained in exchange for them. Gold, on the contrary, though of little use compared with air or water, will exchange for a great quantity of other goods. All right, so let me stop there. So this is the familiar water-diamond paradox that, you know, we often would uh, motivate in our quick glib discussions, especially to an audience that isn't familiar with this stuff, by saying, oh yeah, Adam Smith couldn't explain why a pound of diamonds had a higher market price than you know, a gallon of water. But we, you know, we moderns know, duh, 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 okay. And so that's, it seems like it's right that didn't Ricardo just say that? Is it, isn't even Ricardo himself confused and he doesn't know, geez, this is a, a mystery. How, how can this be? But what they're trying to do, just so you understand, and I'm going to go back and read some more of Ricardo in a second here and just to show you I'm not grasping at straws or making excuses for him. This is clearly what, where they're coming from, is there's, they were fully aware that, yes, the, the value of goods to humans has to have something to do with their usefulness to humans, right? That there's got to be some connection there. But Adam Smith pointed out, it's, it's a subtle phenomenon or, or issue because the way when people use that word value, and here we can be clear, like if we were talking about Smith and Ricardo, they're speaking in, you know, they're native English speakers, right? Whereas with, say, in Bastiat, you could say, well, part of the issue might be that, you know, they're speaking and writing in French and, you know, maybe there's an issue with the translation. But here, clearly, we've got native English speakers, so there's no ambiguity coming from that. 
And so Smith's point was when we talk about value and then we as, you know, pioneers in this budding new discipline of political economy or the moral philosophy or whatever are trying to lay down some principles to help organize our thoughts around economic matters that this word value has at least two distinct meanings. And so one is what he called use value and the other is exchange value. And so to say, hey, is that object valuable? He's saying you might mean at least one of, or you might mean one of at least two separate things. So one thing is just meaning, do you personally, can you use this thing? And so that's why you would say it's valuable. Or you might mean I could go into the marketplace and sell this for a lot of money, for example, and then use the money to go buy something else. Or even if you don't want to bring money in because you think that complicates it, even with barter, you could go with this thing and trade it away for something, you know, that the the people in the community generally think is of high value also. Okay, so that's the distinction he's making. Just like if you're in prison and you have a carton of cigarettes, that's very valuable even if you don't smoke, right? So that would be exchange value. Whereas somebody who's in prison and, you know, they're, they love smoking and they're going crazy because I haven't had a cigarette in 48 hours. Ah, and then someone holds up a carton of cigarettes. They might say, oh, yes, I value that very highly. To them, it would be use value. Okay. So clearly there's, you know, some connection between the two. Everybody knows that if you're in prison and somebody's dying for a cigarette and you hold up some rat poison and say, hey, this will fix it. They say, no, I don't want that. And so hence, the rat poison not only would have no use value to anybody, um, except, you know, the kitchen chef who wants to kill the rat infestation. But then, correspondingly, it wouldn't have any exchange value either. If nobody, if nobody's be able to use it, then nobody wants it. And so therefore, it's got no exchange value, right? So the classical economists understood that. But the issue was, it wasn't simply a one-to-one. That's the point. Right, that you're saying, yes, there's some connection, we all agree, that of exchange value to use value, but it's not just exchange value derives from use value, and that's the end of the story. That's the full explanation, because look, there's plenty of cases where the two do not go hand in hand. You've got examples of things that have a high use value, like air and water, indispensable to life, so very useful, but yet they don't have a high market price. In fact, they have a zero price in most cases. On the other hand, there are things that don't seem intrinsically to be very useful. It's just they're pretty to look at. That if we had to go through and start eliminating things from planet Earth, we would knock out gold and silver and rubies way earlier than we would knock out air and water or even you know horses and wheat. And yet, in general, you know, you find a treasure chest in the woods and you open it up, you're hoping to find a bunch of rubies and silver and gold coins, not a bushel of wheat, right? So that was the issue, and that's the point Adam Smith was making, okay? And so now let me go back to uh, Reed Ricardo here. Utility, then, is not the measure of exchangeable value although it is absolutely essential to it, all right? So let me just read that again. Utility, then, is not the measure of exchangeable value, although it is absolutely essential to it, okay? So what he's saying is there, again, with that distinction between use value and exchange value, where there are things that are very useful, have high utility, right? So this is pretty straightforward, that when the classical economists and then even the original pioneers of the marginal revolution, guys like Menger, Wieser, Bambavark, and also, you know, William Stanley Jevons and Leon Wal Ross, when they were using the word utility, it didn't have some special economic connotation. It wasn't yet a technical term. They just were almost using it interchangeably as with usefulness, just like the lay public. If you say like, hey, did that trip you took to the Bahamas serve some utility for you? And you would, you know, could say, oh, oh yeah, because I... Uh, I, I might buy a property down there, and so I was checking that or whatever. But and I went and enjoyed the beach and whatever. You see, like that, you might speak like that, and so that's kind of the way they're using it then. So for them, utility just meant use value. Okay, so he's saying utility then is not the measure of exchangeable value, although it's absolutely essential to it. 
if a commodity were in no way useful, in other words, if it could in no way contribute to our gratification, it would be destitute of exchangeable value, however scarce it might be, or whatever quantity of labor might be necessary to procure it. Okay, so this is from like page one or two. I'm looking at an HTML version, so I can't see the exact pagination. But this is chapter one of David Ricardo's, you know, one of his treatises, right? When he's flat out saying utility is absolutely essential for a good to have exchange value in the marketplace. If it didn't have any usefulness to anybody, it wouldn't have any exchange value. All right, so just be careful. My, the reason I'm beating this up, in case you're thinking, yeah, we get it, Bob, move on, is often when modern economists try to blow up, or not try to, but do blow up a crude version of the labor theory of value, you know, we might say things like, it doesn't matter how much labor went into something per se, like I could spend 100 hours making a pie out of rat poison and, you know, dog excrement. It doesn't mean I'm going to be able to charge 10 times as much as a pie that or a cake that took collectively 10 hours of labor, including all the, you know, ingredients. That doesn't follow, right? So the mere act of adding more labor to something doesn't mean it's going to have a higher exchange value if the thing that you're pouring the labor effort into is not something anybody wants. That doesn't give, you know, use it's not useful to anybody. Okay? So Ricardo was writing that in 1821, the latest. Right, so that's not a novel insight that the marginal revolution gave us. They knew that, but again, the the point is, they were saying we need more to explain why is it that you know one horse trades for this many bushels of wheat. It's not enough just to say, oh, because humans get more utility from horses than from wheat which you, know, you might be tempted to say if you were going to try to use utility to explain market prices because the classical economists are saying, well, no, that, that can't be the full story. I'm just repeating myself here. I just want to make sure I'm not losing anybody because if you thought that, you'd say, all right, well, what about a bottle of water versus a, a gold ring? Well, water is way more useful, has higher utility to people than gold rings do. So you would think the bottle of water should have a higher market value than the gold ring, but that's not true empirically, right? So that's why they were they thought this is going down a dead end if we try to invoke utility as the explanation for market exchange value. And, and by the way, that's what we're trying to do as economists. That's one of our chief tasks is just to look out at the world and we see different prices for things and to come up with some systematic explanation or at least a framework to explain this, these observations. Just like in astronomy, you know, you get, can see the planets and they're in different places in the sky on different dates and you try to come up with a model that makes sense of that with you know, a few basic principles. And likewise, economists back then, but even to this day, one of the things we're supposed to do as theorists is to just explain, to come up with a model, if you will, or a framework, if you don't like that word model, to understand how our price is formed in the marketplace and why, for example, does a gold ring typically trade for a much higher value vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, units of other goods, including the money commodity, compared to a bottle of water? Why is that? Okay, and again, they thought you can't tell me it's because the gold ring is more useful than the bottle of water. No, the bottle of water staves off death. Gold ring doesn't do that. So what are you talking about? All right, so that's the issue. All right, let me just read a little bit more from Ricardo. Possessing utility, commodities derive their exchangeable value from two sources, from their scarcity and from the quantity of labor required to obtain them. There are some commodities, the value of which is determined by their scarcity alone. No labor can increase the quantity of such goods, and therefore their value cannot be lowered by an increased supply. Some rare statues and pictures, scarce books and coins, wines of a peculiar quality, which can be made only from grapes grown on a particular soil, of which there is a very limited quantity, are all of this description. Their value is wholly independent of the quantity of labor originally necessary to produce them, 
and varies with the varying wealth and inclinations of those who are desirous to possess them. All right, so I'll stop there. So a minute ago, I explained to you that when we sort of set up this caricature of the straw man and say, yeah, guys like Adam Smith and David Ricardo, they were baffled as to why gold rings traded for a higher price than bottles of water. By the way, back then, they probably didn't even have bottles of water, but you get the point. Um, but also, and I think I said this in the episode I did on JB Say when I kind of went off on a tangent talking about the labor and cost theory of value and saying those approaches can't explain like a Picasso painting now, so, you know, since Picasso's no longer with us, how do we, what principles do we use to explain if somebody, you know, some rich collector dies and then their estate goes to auction and a famous Picasso painting is up for sale and somebody pays a price for it, what principles can we use as economists to explain what price it fetches? Clearly, it has nothing to do with how many labor hours would go into making another comparable unit of that good. That No, because they're, it's impossible. You can't. And But it's not like, oh, so we have no idea. Like, no, we have a framework to explain that. All right, so my point here is that's not something that the classical economists were ignorant of. Ricardo himself in this treatise is saying, yeah, if it comes to the goods that are not reproducible, then what do you use? Just scarcity alone. And he even said how much people are desirous of obtaining these things, right? So he had some connection there. It wasn't merely scarcity, but it was also, you know, there's some connection to people. What do they want to spend their money on? Okay. And so you might say, all right, so at what point does Ricardo start saying something wrong? And it's not even that it's wrong. I just want to explain to you why they went the way they did with their theorizing. And don't worry, I'm almost done with these excerpts now from Ricardo. These commodities, however, so here he's referring to things like rare books and paintings or whatever that can't be reproduced or, you know, a, like a champagne that, like a, a true champagne where the grapes just come from a certain region. So it's not like, oh, wow, if the, if the rate of return on bottles of champagne is higher than on bottles of apple juice, more people will shift into, or I should say grape juice, let's say, to make it a, a more sensible statement people will shift more into, you You can't if if we're talking about actual grapes coming from that particular region, that it's not just other um, vineyards around the world can just increase their output to take advantage of that higher rate of return in the champagne sector. Okay, so, that, so he's referring to those types of goods where he's admitting a labor theory of value doesn't work. He's saying these commodities, however, form a very small part of the mass of commodities daily exchanged in the market. By far, the greatest part of those goods, which are the objects of desire, are procured by labor, and they may be multiplied, not in one country alone, but in many, almost without any assignable limit, if we are disposed to bestow the labor necessary to obtain them. In speaking, then, of commodities, of their exchangeable value, and of the laws which regulate their relative prices— we mean always such commodities only as can be increased in quantity by the exertion of human industry and on the production of which competition operates without restraint. All right, so I'll stop there. But my point here is, strictly speaking, if you are reading Ricardo, especially if you're a bit generous in the interpretation, he didn't say anything demonstrably false. All right, he wasn't saying, oh, yeah, the more labor hours you pour into something, the more value it has to have. That, no, he admitted up front that's not the case. And he also wasn't saying the principles you would use in as, a, as an economist or a political economist to explain the exchange ratios of any goods whatsoever in the marketplace have to do with how much labor at least is necessary to make one more unit of it, of the two different goods. No, nope, he didn't say that. He explicitly said at the outset I'm not talking about things like paintings and rare books and whatever from dead authors. But it's, that's not what we're talking about. And moreover, he said the principles you would use to explain the price of those, he's basically right. Like he didn't give you the full story, but he didn't say anything wrong about how would you go about understanding the market's valuation placed on a, you know, a, a Rembrandt or something. 
Okay, so he didn't say anything wrong there. But what he said was, as a, as a theorist here, what I'm going to do now in the rest of this book, or one big thing I'm going to try to do in this book, amongst other tasks, is I'm going to lay down the principles by which we can understand the relative market prices that are going to persist in long-run equilibrium in that class of commodities that can be produced if we just pour more labor into it or into them. Okay, and his point is that is by far a much bigger share of the total flow of goods and services that we see in the marketplace day in and day out. And so as economists, if we can explain that, we're doing a pretty good job. Okay. So again, just be careful that you're not setting up a straw man or a caricature of the classical economist. Now, having gone through all that, let me take the remaining time in this episode of the Human Action Podcast to explain what the marginal revolution was and why it was better. Okay, why our modern theory is better, and I disagree with what Ricardo did there. Fundamentally, I think the modern subjectivist marginal approach to value theory is superior to the classical approach in the same way that Einstein's theory of relativity is superior to Newtonian mechanics. So specifically, you know, Isaac Newton came up with a system that was pretty good at explaining the motion of matter in everyday life, right? That things that didn't go very fast relative to the speed of light and that weren't very massive, you know, relative, let's say, to the mass of the sun. Okay, that Newton's system did a pretty good job approximating that stuff. You know, you could use Newton to understand the, the solar system and anything that you're going to conventionally see on Earth, at least with the technology they had, as of you know his day, they weren't they didn't have particle accelerators and things, and they couldn't see very you know their microscopes or whatever weren't very powerful, so they actually couldn't drill down and and see things at the microscopic level. Okay, however, as I'm sure you know, Einstein comes along and he shows that no, when things move close to the speed of light, Newton's framework completely collapses, and also there's some quirks with very massive objects that um, some of the, the predictions coming out of the Newtonian framework aren't quite right. And that's why, for example, you know, if you, if you take a clock and you put it in a rocket ship and the rocket ship goes super fast, the, and then, it, you know, it comes back to Earth and stops and you open up and look at it, less time will have elapsed on that clock than on a sister clock that stayed on Earth the whole time, right? The Newtonian framework, that doesn't make any sense, but you know, Einstein's special relativity can explain it. And then general relativity can explain things like Mercury has like a little wobble in its orbit around the sun. And Einstein's theory, which views gravity really just as a curvature of space-time around massive objects rather than like a force that's proportional to the masses of the two objects and, you know, inversely proportional to the square of the distance, that's not quite right. That's an approximation. And so Einstein's equations which are more complicated they're harder to solve if you plug in that the masses are relatively low and the, the velocities are very low compared to the speed of light einstein's equations reduce to the newtonian equations okay so in that spirit then i'm saying that's what we have now that we have a more robust framework with modern value theory, that we can explain any market price. Whereas Ricardo was just showing us if we restrict our attention to reproducible goods, we've got a pretty decent explanation of that. Whereas in this other area, we have to have a completely different set of principles to explain the price of you know paintings from dead masters and so forth. So the modern approach 
doesn't need to have that bifurcation. We just say, I don't care what kind of good or service it is. These are the principles we use as economists to explain its exchange value in the marketplace. doesn't matter if it's reproducible or not. It's the same basic framework to explain, you know, what are the laws of market value, if you want to say that. Okay, so there's, there's that main element. And now let me just go through and, and give you some more. And what I'm doing here is I'm summarizing my article from the Journal of Libertarian Studies. So back in 2006, I believe, Roderick Long organized a symposium that was a response to Kevin Carson's, at the time, I think it was recently released, uh, I think it was called like Studies in Mutualist Philosophy or something like that. And so w among other things, what this guy Kevin Carson was trying to do was rehabilitate the labor theory of value. And so in my paper that was part of the symposium, I responded to Carson and I said, no, there's a reason we've discarded the labor theory of value and here's some of the problems with it. All right. So that's what I'm summarizing right here. So if you want to, I'll link to it, obviously, if you want to go read more and I'll also link to Ricardo's principles book, if you want to read more, you know, from these old school guys. Okay, so let me explain, I'll give you a quick example, and then I'll move into the more systematic list of the objections that I laid out in the article. So just to motivate this, to show the sense in which the classical economists, it's not that they were wrong, but they weren't really giving a comprehensive first principles explanation. Imagine you, you go on a trip to New York City, and you go and you see a play, and you come out and you guys are hungry, you know, whoever you're with and if your family or something, if, you, if you've if you got a family or your boyfriend or girlfriend, whatever, and you're walking and you're, you know what, I'm hungry. Why don't we get, hey, there's a diner. Why don't we get like a, like a Reuben or something, right? I always see that on TV or, you know, you watch Seinfeld and I always wanted, you know, we're visiting New York here. We just came out of a Broadway show. Let's go stop at the diner and get like a classic New York City sandwich because I've heard great things about it. So you go in there and you see the menu, and you're just astonished at how much they're going to charge you for a sandwich, but not just the sandwich, how much they're going to charge you for a Coke, too. Like, it's way more just to get a Coke than it would be back in your rural hometown, let's say, you know, assume you're from the Midwest or something, tr visiting, and geez, if I went to a diner in my hometown, they wouldn't charge me this much for a Coke. What, what the heck's going on here? What? And then you can imagine somebody at the table with you might say, well, I mean, they have to charge that much for the Coke and for the sandwich because do you know the rent of this place? Like we're sitting here right, you know, on Broadway in the middle of Manhattan at a diner. So, I mean, do you know how much this real estate costs? And so by implicitly, you know, if, whether they're the owners or not, the, you know, the people running this restaurant, either they own this land. And so there's the the, the, the implicit what economists call opportunity costs, they could be renting it out to somebody else. Or if they aren't the owners, they're paying monthly rent to the landlord. And can you imagine how much they pay per month, forget taxes, for this prime piece of, you know, this location is what they're paying for, that right down the street from Broadway shows. And so in order for the people running this restaurant to even break even, of course they have to charge more for their pastrami sandwiches and Cokes than some diner in Idaho or whatever, right? Because the, right? Now, what I just said, there's nothing wrong with that. That's a perfectly reasonable statement. And that can explain why it's the case that you don't see diners near 42nd Street in Manhattan that charge 50 cents for a Coke and charge, you know, $5 for a foot long sub that that's, that just, that they wouldn't be able to stay in business, okay? So that makes sense. But that's really just a, a small explanation, right? That's why you can rule out certain things given everything else that you're just assuming is, is the case. But if you kind of step back and just more broadly say, okay, but why is it that real estate prices or, you know, the, the monthly price for rent of this location 
is so much higher in Manhattan than it is in the middle of Idaho, you, you can't just keep appealing to the costs, right? At some point, you're going to have to explain, well, why, why is this price higher than another one? And you can't just keep saying, oh, because the cost of making that's more because then that just pushes the problem back one step, right? So again, somebody who says, how come this diner is charging so much? And the person said, well, because they have to, because their costs are so high here in the city. Again, what they that's a true statement and it's it helps you to understand. It maybe diffuses your anger if you just think they're ripping you off. But ultimately, you know, that's not the full explanation. And just to take that a little bit further too, if the diner were serving sandwiches that were disgusting and they were given not cans of Coke, but cans of arsenic and trying to charge high prices to people who are hungry and thirsty, they would also go out of business. Okay, so again, it's it's this two-pronged thing, like to explain the long-run level of the prices and why in the marketplace a Coke served at a diner on Broadway is more valuable than a Coke served in the middle of Idaho in a diner. It's a combination of costs, but also demand factors, right? Even there. Okay. So let me now give you a, let me, let me first explain the, the substitute and then I'll circle back. And once you have that, I, I can give you a more systematic overview of the problems with the original labor or cost theory. All right. So what, what supplanted it? What do we use now? What's the superior approach? Again, it was 1871. There were two people, and I think it was 1874 was Wal Ross. But these three are credited, Carl Menger, William Stanley Jevons, and Leon Wal Ross. It, 1871 through 1874 was the so-called marginal revolution. So the, the significant insight, the thing that was tripping up Adam Smith and David Ricardo and other great classical economists, solid as they may have been on many areas, and even with the appreciation of the role of utility, is they didn't get the marginal part. That's the issue. So yes, air is more useful to humans than gold is. But one unit on the margin of air is not useful to humans, right? If aliens came and sucked a cubic meter of air from our atmosphere, you know, sucked it into their spaceship, it's not that any human would even notice that. Whereas if aliens showed up and they sucked, you know, 10 ounces of gold that was had already been mined and, you know, was, was in humans' possession away from humanity, that would bother at least some people. Okay. I mean, you could even, you could say I was stacking the deck there because like, what if they stole gold that was under the earth's crust? Nobody would know. Okay. But suppose the air they stole was like the air right around your face, right? The air that you were just about to breathe in, somehow the aliens, you know, used a transporter like in Star Trek and beam that away from your face and up into their ship. You might notice something weird as the rest of the air suddenly filled that vacuum you know, you might <laughs> feel like the, the wind blow, what the heck was that? But you'd be fine, right? That, that particular volume of air doesn't mean anything to anybody. It's not valuable on the margin. Whereas the gold that's, you know, sitting in somebody's vault at home or, you know, hanging around their neck in the form of a necklace and, you know, on their fingers as rings and whatever, if the aliens sucked that gold away and beamed it up, People would be outraged. They say, here, somebody just robbed me. Okay? So that's the essential insight. And again, I'm, I'm not even saying if you look, you know, up to December 31st, 1870, no human being had ever said anything even remotely close to what I just said. I'm not claiming that. I'm just saying nobody systematically wrote that up and came up with a way and saying, hey, everybody, this is a way we can explain market prices from scratch. This is a better foundation upon which to build our system of understanding that that's what Menger and Well Ross and Jevons pioneered, okay? And so you can see, you know, that's why it's called the marginal revolution. And that's, you know, the term marginal utility 
to explain market value. So you, see, you see how that's working? And I was like, oh, okay, so it's not just the utility, it's the marginal utility. That's the thing that sort of regulates, you know, that's a term they like to use a lot, market value, okay? Um, and notice too, market value means exchange, like how much does it exchange for measured, if you will, in terms of other commodities. Okay, so even there, there's an issue for, a, I think, a lot of modern Austrians, the term value to them is inherently subjective because, you know, we got subjective value theory, right? So value subjective, you can't measure it. It's, it's uh, you know, qualitative, not quantitative. It's ordinal, not cardinal, if you know those terms. And, and yes, if what you mean is subjective value rankings, but the way economists talked in the 1800s is they were trying to explain market value. So they would make that distinction between use value and exchange value. But again, it when you're talking about market value, that means what can I fetch in the marketplace with this? That's what we're talking about. So you're ultimately ex explaining the exchange ratios of goods. Now, another, I think, critical thing that the marginal subjectivist approach solidified was the idea that, you know, from scratch, step one, if people in the market exchange, you know, one person trades away X in exchange for Y, and that means the person on the other end traded away Y to get X, to explain that you do not try to figure out, okay, there's some equality between the two that they have equal market value and therefore I have to figure out you know what is the same between those two things to explain the equality of their market valuation but that's a mistake you're, you're not going to get anywhere with that explanation the, the first ground zero thing to say is the subjective valuation the ordinal ranking of those marginal units the person who traded away X to get Y valued that unit of Y more than he subjectively valued the unit of X that he gave up. And then, you know, the mirror image on the other side. You need to start with that. And then from that starting point to assume everybody in the community has a subjective ranking of particular units of each type of good and service then you can start to tell a story about, okay, so then now if they start interacting with each other, if they can exchange, you know, two particular units of these things and both people prefer what they're obtaining compared to what they gave up, then we would think that trade would occur. And then you just start going from there and then you come up with principles to say, okay, at what point would the rearrangement of the existing stock of units of goods and services cease? because now there are no more gains from trade. And then, you know, that's the way you start building up an understanding. Oh, okay. And so those are the principles determining the equilibrium exchange ratios of these types of goods, you know, units of these various types of goods and services for each other. Okay. So I'm not going to here go into it. If, if you want to see it spelled out, you know, there's, there's Rothbard does a really good job in man, economy, and state. I do it at a, a more um, simplistic level in my lessons for the young economist, if you want to see it there, where I, you know, I don't assume anything. I start from scratch and give a specific. I use Halloween candy as the example, and just you know, kids who come home and they have different amounts of Snickers and Milky Ways and whatever in their various bags, and then they have preferences, and then they trade with each other. And so I kind of just show how would you explain what you know what happens in that environment. Okay, so I can. Spell it out for you there if you want to go read it, but I'm just right here in this episode of the Human Action Podcast showing you that's the approach they used. And everything then was built on that. And so, for example, to understand why is it that the soda is more expensive in the diner, you know, in Manhattan than in Idaho, you need to start with people really like to see Broadway shows. And so then now there's a reason that people want to be in New York and then hence, if they're hungry, you know, are going to be there next to the diner. But then it still has to be the case that those people, given their circumstances and that they're, you know, they just came out of the, the Broadway show and they're hungry and thirsty, 
that on the margin, yes, getting a Coke by only having to walk 100 yards, they value that more than traveling back to Idaho, for example, and getting a Coke in Idaho. And so that helps to explain, you know, how can it be that the price of the you know soda in the New York diner is higher? Okay. Incidentally, Menger didn't give the full story. A lot of what we nowadays use in standard terminology was developed by Wieser, okay, who was, you know, kind of like the next generation and who also, incidentally, was the brother-in-law of Eugen von Bambavik. Okay, so in terms of the pantheon, it's, you know, Menger is Zeus or whatever. He's the granddaddy, the patriarch of the Austrian school, and then... Bambavik and Wieser developed those insights. The one way I describe what Bambavik did with capital and interest theory is he took the new subjectivist marginal approach to value theory and just applied it in an intertemporal context, right? So Menger fundamentally said interest, the phenomenon of interest that we see in the marketplace, why is it that when I buy inputs today, intending to sell them, you know, as some output good, let's say a year from now, why is there this margin, this gap that seems to always persist? How can it be that I can spend $100 on inputs today, fully expecting a year from now, I'm going to sell the output for $105? Why, why don't the prices of the inputs get bid up? And the, you know, why don't people flow into this sector, bid up the prices of the inputs, to make more of that future output, which would push down the price, you know, a year from now until the point at which you got to spend 103 to get the inputs today to then sell the finished product a year from now for 103. How come that, that margin doesn't get whittled away? And so lots of economists and writers over the centuries had tried to explain that. And Bobovic went through and blew them all up in his mind. And I think correctly or accurately. And then his own explanation, what was again, the ground zero, out of the gate explanation is he said, because present goods are more valuable than future goods on the margin. That's why. And then everything else followed from that. So again, he he was starting from a you know evaluation with the modern marginal subjectivist approach. Okay. But Wieser actually is credited in terms of the history of economic thought with developing what was called imputation theory, so that some of the principles he used, people later discarded and said, no, nah, that's, we don't need that. And it's kind of, you know, only works in specialized circumstances. But the idea of saying, okay, take Menger's approach. And really what that's good for is explaining the exchange ratios of final goods. Like just to say, you know, why is it that steak at the grocery store trades at a higher relative price per pound than hamburger meat, ultimately, because consumers like to eat steak more. I mean, you can ask why, and but you know, and so as far as the economics is concerned, you can stop there and say consumers enjoy eating steak more than they enjoy eating hamburger, pound for pound. And so that's why, you know, that's that element is going to be integral in the explanation of these exchange ratios, and then you go forward. But then to explain something like, okay, but why? does a brain surgeon earn more per hour of his labor than a plumber does? And there, you don't just directly say, oh, because people naturally enjoy brain surgery more than plumbing, the way you would just state as a fact, people like eating steak more than hamburger. You don't have to explain why. No, when it comes to what what's called factors of production, there, the economists expected to do more. And say, well, but why? And then you can, then you get into so-called imputation theory, or what we now would call marginal productivity theory. All right, and so there, it's you know, it's an extension, an elaboration of the direct explanation of finished prices to then sort of go upward in the chain and say, okay, if we understand, put it this way, if you understand why a bottle of wine has a higher market value than a bottle of grape juice than, or, or let's say than, than um, a pack of cigarettes. 
then you can start to understand, oh, and so this is why, you know, the farmers would plant more grapes here rather than tobacco. All right, you can start explaining that and you see how the, it works like that. All right, so you start with the basic, you know, the finished goods, and then you work backwards and say, oh, yeah, that land has, is going to have a certain price, like with the, the diner in New York City. To understand why is the real estate so expensive in New York, you start with because there's a lot of attractions in New York City that outside tourists are willing to pay for to go visit, or even the, you know, the people that live in New York. They're willing to pay more to see a Broadway show, not simply because, oh, the Broadway show has to charge more than a theater, a community theater in Idaho, but because, no, people really just directly value that experience more. They're willing to pay more for it. That's, you know, the ground zero explanation. And then you can explain the prices of remove. So again, the value of the vineyard is derived from the value of the wine bottle to the consumer, not the other way around. That you're not using costs of production to explain final retail prices. You're you're going in the other direction, at least conceptually, right? In terms of chronological order, people pay prices, you know, for grapes, or to you know, the farmer has to pay prices for the the land on which you know the vineyard sits first. And then you harvest the grapes and then you make the wine and then maybe, you know, let it sit there for 10 years before you sell it, of course. But the point is how much you're willing to pay for the land that you know you can raise certain types of grapes on to sell wine. You're looking ahead and guessing, anticipating what the bottles of wine will fetch in the market from consumers who value it directly for consumption purposes. All right. So that's kind of the, the flow. So anyway, my point is Wieser is credited in the history of thought. You know, he was writing in German, but with so-called imputation theory, but also uh, the term marginal utility. Again, he wasn't writing in English, but he was the one that phrased that, that then, you know, caught fire. And that's not what the term we use. Whereas, you know, Menger didn't exactly use that phrasing. William Stanley Jevons, I think, called it final degree of utility or something like that. So he's even writing in English, right? So even though we credit William Stanley Jevons as being a co-discoverer of marginal utility theory, in his writings, he didn't call it that, right? That Wieser is actually credited with that term. And also opportunity cost, that Wieser is credited with that. So having said all that, one last warning is Mises later in his memoirs said that even though Wieser brought in a lot of these um, pioneering innovations into you know our modern tool Kit as economist, he felt that Wieser never fully absorbed the subjectivist element from Menger, and that in Mises' view, Wieser himself was more of a um, a member of the Lassan school, uh, meaning the Walrasian approach. Also, too, people can point to like Wieser was not the biggest uh, diehard fan of classical liberalism and individual liberty. I'll just leave it at that if you want to go to research on the guy. Okay. So anyway, that's um, just to give more of color here in terms of the development. Okay. So as promised, let me now very quickly just run through to round out this episode, some of the problems with the cost or labor theory of value, and then why the marginal subjectivist theory that I've sketched for you is better. Okay, so one issue which is methodological that to explain market prices, you ultimately we want to be forward-looking, right? That economics is based on action, and when you make action, bygones are bygones. You know, it, it's important to know what happened, perhaps, but really when you're making action, it's because you want to influence the future. Okay, so the recycle an example I used last time. If you're out in the woods and you find a brand new car or what looks like a brand new car, right? If you don't know its origin, how do you know? And and you say, well, does this have market value? Strictly speaking, whatever went into its construction is irrelevant. All that really matters is, can I use this thing now? And then more specifically, on the margin, me adding this particular unit of this vehicle to my inventory how much you know usefulness? What what things can I achieve in the future 
if I have this item in my possession versus not. That's the issue. Okay, the, the, the past doesn't really matter. And so that's why I just, in terms of methodology or methodological considerations, an explanation of market prices that is forward looking and just says what, you know, how useful are these items to people and what can they do with them and how does it help them satisfy their objectives? That just philosophically, if you will, makes more sense. Okay. Uh, another point that everybody acknowledges is that the old cost or labor theory of value at best was only a long run phenomenon that explained reproducible commodities. Another issue is the time element. Um, so again, at best, the old approach just explains sort of like long run tendencies. It couldn't explain day to day fluctuations that might have been due to hiccups in supply or demand, right? Like if there was, a, if all of a sudden everybody just doesn't like smoking because there's a report that comes out about, oh, it gives you cancer, there would be, you know, losses suffered in the cigarette industry. Like for all the, the people that had, cigarette, you know, cartons of cigarettes in their inventory in their warehouses, they would suffer losses if all of a sudden the consumer just wanted to stop smoking. And then, you know, ultimately the farmers who had been planting tobacco, they would get the feedback from that and they would switch over to other crops. But the point is there would be a transition period there. And so the, the you know, the cost or labor theory of value to explain the exchange ratios between cigarettes and um, gold or whatever or between an acre of land that's devoted to tobacco versus an acre of land that's devoted to wheat, all of that would go out the window if there was a sudden change in consumer preferences and it would take time to get reestablished. Okay, so again, the stuff about how much labor power went into this thing, at best, that's not only confined to reproducible goods, but even if we're just looking at reproducible goods, it's really only a long run statement. Like once things settle down and stay the same day in and day out and everybody adjusts to the new equilibrium, then these principles that like Ricardo laid out in his treatise can help you explain the relative exchange rates of things in the marketplace. Another issue with the time element is it's a little bit tricky to understand the phenomenon of interest, right? Why, why is it? that, um, you know, if, if some goods, if, if two different types of goods had the same amount of labor hours necessary for their construction, but for one of them, once you pour in the labor, you got to wait 10 years for it to mature and then be, be usable for, to the consumer versus another one that's, you know, six minutes after you're done pouring the labor in, it's ready to be sold. Those are going to have different exchange ratios in the marketplace. And it's hard to explain that if you're just focusing on, you know, well, how many labor hours does it take to make one more unit of each of these respective goods if you're ignoring the time element? And again, it's because, as Bumbavrik showed so clearly, you're starting off in the wrong point. What you need to do is explain the subjectivist marginal utility of additional units of a good available, available 10 years from now versus one of it available six minutes from now. And once you understand that, then you can work backwards and start understanding, well, okay, well, so then why would you hire more workers to make more units and da, 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 you know, okay. Another element is just the cost or prices. Okay, so if what you're trying to basically do is explain a particular market price right now by reference to the cost of production, clearly that's just a partial one-off explanation because those costs are themselves prices, right? So it's clearly the general explanation of market prices can't take as a given. All right, well, what are the prices of all the inputs right now? And then we can explain the prices of the outputs that must be true in long run equilibrium. Again, that's a, the best a partial explanation. If, if from scratch, if you had no idea what the prices of anything were, all you had were like the raw primitives of you know, consumer preferences and technology and whatever and resource stocks, Menger, Walras, and Jevons showed, you give me those ingredients, I can tell you at least the general principles of how market prices would be formed in this you know, hypothetical economy. Whereas if you're starting from a cost of production approach, not so much. And even with the labor 
so again, I'm being a little bit unfair. Like I think Ricardo could say, yeah, well, I can do that though if you give me that stuff because it has to do with the labor. Even there, I think there's a little bit, he kind of handled it with the scarcity stuff, but where they're coming from, the the the, the cost theorists who ultimately it, it boiled down to or was distilled down to or reduced to a labor theory which, you know, clearly that's what Ricardo was giving us. He even summarized that, you know, in the beginning of his chapter there. Where they're coming from is that you might say, why are they just focused on labor? Like if I have to, like with my diner example, right? It's, um, you know, it's not just that I have to pay the waitresses more to get them to be willing to live in Manhattan and serve the Coke. Like it's, no, the, the rental, but even there they're going to say, yeah, but it's not that, Mother Nature is directly charging us more. That ultimate the ultimate break on things is human labor, you know, and that's kind of where they're going. But even Ricardo kind of had a throwaway line there, if you remember, where he was talking about scarcity. So even there, I think he would say, yes, if there's certain arable land that's of a higher quality than anything else on Earth, the owner of that is going to receive a differential rent. And there, that wouldn't be purely due to, you know, it's not about labor. So he does kind of have that in his framework. But again, his his the basic statement of his principles, you might not realize that until you dig into the book. Okay, so I think that's a good place to wrap up. So again, take away, yes, the, well, well now you probably know why we call it the marginalist revolution, whereas you might have thought, if we're supplanting a cost or a labor theory of value with the modern utilities theory, isn't it also the subjectivist revolution? And, and it is, but again, I'm showing you the specific stumbling block. It wasn't that pre-1871, the classical economists didn't think utility had anything to do with it. They, they knew it did. It was just, they thought that's not enough. We gotta have something else, you know, to give more meat on the bone here to the reader. And so that's why they focused on, you know, the things that made sense to them. But again, the it, it, was, it was the insight of, oh, no, it's not the utility that explains market value. It's the marginal utility that directly explains market value. And that's what you got to do as a starting point. But the subjectivism also is important, too. Like I say, if you're, tr if you're looking at, oh, two, two items traded for each other in the market, and you're trying to figure out what is it besides the fact that they traded one for one, what is it that explains that, that, you know, what, what quantity or, or substance is in them that is also equal to explain their equality of market value? No, there you're, you're not going to get anywhere with that. That it's the inequality in the valuation on the margin, but in reverse fashion from the two parties that explains the voluntary trade and then that trade itself is establishing the equality of market value, right? So if if one apple trades for four quarters, it's because the guy selling the apple valued the you know those four extra units of quarters more than he valued that last unit of apple in terms of his inventory, and the buyer valued that unit of the apple more than those last four units of his quarters in terms of his inventory. So that explains that trade. But then we say, ah, and that's the market value of one apple equals the market value of four quarters. Okay, so, so market value is cardinal and objective, even though it's you explain it by reference to underlying subjective ordinal preferences. Okay, so it's a, an interesting framework to work through all that. And that's stuff that, you know, Menger showed how, you know, gave the vision as Schumpeter said, Menger was nobody's pupil, meaning that Menger kind of just created this de novo, if you will. And then Bambavar took that framework and then really spelled it out in terms, you know, in terms of Bambavar, not the stuff he wrote out. I mean, he did do it in his capital and interest stuff, but he had a separate book. Uh, I think it's called something like Principles of Economic Value or something like that just going through the, you know, the distinction between exchange value, use value. There's lots of interesting things. Again, if you're in prison and you get a carton of cigarettes, that's very valuable to you, even directly in a sense. 
that if you, you know, if you had to choose between a carton of cigarettes and a can of ham, even if you were hungry and wanted to eat the ham, there's a sense in which, no, you would choose the carton of cigarettes. And so like, he just came up with a framework to explain all that, that knowing its higher exchange value, in a sense, has a feedback loop, even for your personal rankings, that you still value the carton of cigarettes more than the can of ham, even though you're not a smoker, because you know now you have knowledge about, oh, what I can trade this carton for, and I can get 10 cans of ham if I'm just willing to wait a day, okay? Things like that. Okay, so that's a good spot to wrap up. Thanks for your attention, everybody. See you next time. Check back next week for a new episode of the Human Action Podcast. In the meantime, you can find more content like this on Mises.org.